the Victorious Living on a Wednesday night. Yeah. We just had a wonderful brag on God time. So thank you, God, for all you're doing. We praise God. So have you ever wondered that you have been forgotten by God? Have you ever wondered, has God forgotten me? God, I'm still here. I'm waiting. Well, tonight, we're not going to do a lot of review. We're going to jump right in. Um, but if you missed last week of dreams and detours, remember you can go to our YouTube channel, Victorious Living, and you can get the archive of all past teachings. So but we praise God for that. But tonight, we are going to talk about destiny. God cares about your destiny. Oh, this is going to be good, guys. So the destination of destiny. Sometimes we don't like the journey. We just want to get to the destination, right? But God's all about the journey. Destiny is defined as the appointed state or condition that has been divinely predetermined by God the Father for each of us. Don't you love that? Predetermined, divinely predetermined by God the Father for all of us. Your destiny is your call. It is what you've been created to do, where you are to be, the when, the how, you were born to be, you were created to be God's divine destiny for you. God uses our abilities, our talents, and availabilities to do the job. In other words, we say yes. Amen. So God has given each of us an assignment to complete while we're here on earth. And that is why we're here. We're born for our assignment. We're not here just to survive, just to bump along, just to keep trying to make ends meet. We are here for a purpose, a destiny, an assignment. Is that exciting to you? It is to me too. Quite frankly, why we are born is our destiny. This destiny always has to do with people and always has to do with God's love and being that love of God's message to our world. I realize that the word destiny may sound like being a minister and maybe that shocks you and maybe that scares you and you want to run for the hills. Well, I'm not a minister. But let's go to 1 Peter 4. You know, we're going to line everything up by the Word of God, right? So let's look at what the Word of God has to say to us about our fear of being a minister. Is that true or not? 1 Peter 4, verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Uh-oh. Verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Mm -mm -mm. Did you see, we minister according to the abilities that God has given us. So what could that look like on planet Earth in 2019? Well, one assignment may be the best anointed wait waitress there is. Sharing a great smile and hospitality with her customers every day. God needs godly servers, right? Or maybe it's the ability to be the best landscaper 
window washer, work the assembly in a factory. Maybe God needs your godly character in the office environment or out um, somewhere else, doing something else, in the hospital, maybe even as a retiree. God has put these jobs on our hearts and he gives us the gifts and the talents to complete them. Whether it is your stepping stone to your destiny or your call, God supplies to us all things. Why? Well, just as the scripture we just said, so God may be glorified and draw people to him through us. That's the whole point. So after the detours, after the learning experiences, after the rough edges are all smoothed over, we are ready for the master's use. And this is where your destiny fulfillment is. Now let's go to Isaiah 43. This is a very powerful scripture. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Remember we said after the detours, learning experiences, God's in your story. He smoothed this out a little bit. We're ready for the master's use. Isaiah 43, 18. God is speaking, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Now, God is speaking, if we look at that chapter in context, God is speaking to the children of Israel. They have had some rough times, and they haven't always been obedient children. They're coming out of cap captivity, and all they're doing is, is talking about the former things. And they're glamorizing their past. Oh, it was better back there. Things looked better. Now look at where, where we are. Because they were walking to, into an unknown. So God is saying, quit looking in your rear view mirror. I want you to look ahead. Let's go to verse 19. God continues, see... I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. We talk about this scripture often. I love this scripture. But in the context of chapter 43, there was literally a desert and a wasteland from where they've been to where they were going. So when he said, guys, I'm going to make a way through the desert, truly, it was a desert. <laughs> but for us, could that desert be a dry place? Could that wasteland be the ashes, the waste, the loss that we've, what, what we have gone through? And what was ashes? He wants to stir it up and make it a flaming fire again. So God was speaking to people just like us in chapter 43. Now perhaps you've had more than your share of unfair, negative, a mess. Maybe you've seen it all. But know this, God not only wants to do a new thing, but he wants to use all that mess for you to help someone else with your story. He has a destiny for you, but he wants to give you a new beginning. Wherever you've been, looking back at this moment where you are, he has already begun. So don't give up. Don't think it's too hard. Don't think this is all there is. God is all powerful and he has more in store for you, dear one. So can you make room for it? That's what God is asking in verse 19. Can you see it? Can you perceive it? Can you make room for it? Here it comes. Yeah. The first thing where your destiny begins is not in the classroom, not going back to school. It begins in our thinking. So what do you think about your destiny? Is it limited thinking? 
For example, I can't. It's too late for me. It's too hard. I can't change. I don't want to change. Besides, I'm not worth it. I have no value. I don't have any talents. And what are people going to say? Hmm. No matter where you've been, lost, lonely, not down, God has a new beginning, and it starts at this moment. So your new beginning will stop at the moment that you stop, or will start at the moment that you stop looking backwards. You keep looking back, God is all about looking ahead. God is equipping you for your destiny now. God has been equipping you, and you may not have even known it. He's preparing the way, and he's already created a good finish for you. Take your Bible and go to the New Testament, 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1. You and I need to continually remind ourselves that we have a gift on the inside of us. And the Apostle Paul is talking to a young Pastor Timothy about the gift. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Let me explain. The Apostle Paul has been mentoring young Timothy. He is ready to go out on his own. And Pastor Timothy was just a little nervous. And what that was meaning for laying on of hands, many times the laying on of hands, which was the case of Paul and Timothy, he was transferring and laying on hands for his talents and gifts to be stirred up. And so many times it is that transfer. But we see there's something else going on in verse 7. And the Apostle Paul brings it up to Timothy. He said, Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear. So this tells us he was a little nervous about stepping out on his first journey. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, many times we see verse 6 isolated from 7 or verse 7 isolated from 6 and pulled out out of context. These two go together. So it's your destiny and your gift and, oh, by the way, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, so quit being afraid. God gave you a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. I love that. Your talent gift, your personality, what you have gone through is all a part of what God wants you to share. It's part of your, your gift. It's part of your talent. It's part of your divine destiny. You didn't go through all of that just because. The devil didn't drag you through the mud and through pieces of hell to get where you are today just for nothing. You are brought here for God's purpose, your destiny, and to share what you've gone through with others. And not the victim, but the victory in Jesus' name. A dream accomplished, your destiny, and a life fulfilled. And can I tell you, it's a good life. So how does that sound? Does that sound pretty good so far? All right, I like it too. So there's some points that we need to remember as we're pre preparing for our dream fulfillment. Okay, did you get that? There are some points we need to remember for our dream fulfillment. Number one, destiny requires sacrifice. Yep, it does. There's going to be some preparation but there also might be some subtraction. And there will also be some addition and some dividing and some multiplying. Anybody like math? <laughs> God's going to be doing many things 
as your destiny has a sacrifice. God may require you to take some classes for preparation. God may also require you to take an internship or require mentorship, like the Apostle Paul to young Timothy. God may require you to remove and set some boundaries from some friendships and maybe some old habits. Maybe require you to read some books and to study and, and to get educated so we will grow. You may not be able to hang out with the old gang all the time. And I don't mean the old sinister gang. You've already given all that up. I'm talking about maybe some hanging out with some friends and doing this and doing that. There may be days that God's saying, no, I need you to pray tonight. I need you to study. I need you to be still. There may be some sacrifices. Your destiny is calling you to a higher level. And low level living won't cut it. So don't feel bad over that. Because can I tell you, your destiny is worth it. All those sacrifices mean nothing to live in the high call of Christ. So with destiny, there's so much joy and there's so much fulfillment, you will not miss a thing. I promise you. Number two, this is important. Listen closely to destiny's voice. Because there will be many voices who will want to speak to you. So let's break this down. This is big. There's going to be some voices of some old friends or maybe even some close friends. Voices that may not understand what God has for you or where God is taking you. There may be voices who tell you, you don't have what it takes to do that. You know your background. You can't do that. It's too hard. Walk away. You can't. There may be some voices that will try to sway you to other people's opinions. God's voice is the only voice to listen to. And when other people talk, line it up with God and His Word. And if it doesn't match, then I love you, dear friend, but I, I can't listen to that. Go to Proverbs 19. Keep your finger in Proverbs. We're going to be there for a little bit. I love how God's Word speaks directly to us in every area that we live. Proverbs 19, 20. This is a good one. This is one of those that needs some stars and some lightning bolts and highlight. Proverbs 19, 20. Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. Now let's face it. We're all living in our latter days, right? Yeah. So it's speaking to us. Verse 21. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Yes. Did you get that? Yes. If you didn't, if you didn't quite get the revelation of that, please, please take the scriptures from tonight and meditate on them this week. Listen to the voices of wise counsel. Godly people you trust. Some voices will not apply. So, listening to a, a Harvard professor and listening to your kindergarten teacher about your destiny may not be the voices that you need to listen to. Does that make sense? That sounds a little wacky, but sometimes it's that crazy. You will find satisfaction with your destiny. You will not find satisfaction with your destiny until you close your ears to the wrong voices. Even voices of good intention. Godly people, lovely people, they just don't know. Okay? 
And you know what? It's not up to us to fill them in. So listen to voices that are positive. Listen to voices that are affirming. Listen to voices that may have words of correction from God. And listen to those voices that offer wisdom. Turn your head, your heart, to be trained by those voices that God sends. Godly wisdom will line up with the word of God straight as an arrow. And if it's not, just throw it out. Okay? Are you at Proverbs? Go to Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1, verse 5. Oh, these are good. Proverbs 1, 5. A wise man, say, I'm wise. I'm wise. A wise man will hear and increase learning. And a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Do you know we don't know everything? Or is that a revelation to you? We don't know everything. So we may need to seek wise counsel, wise godly counsel. I love that scripture. Look at verse 7. The fear or reverence, reverence and respect, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Have you ever met someone who won't listen to anybody? They know it all. Well, the Bible calls them, yeah, a fool despise wisdom and instruction. That's why we need to remain teachable. We do not know everything. And no matter how old we get, <clears throat> me too, Mark, it's a new journey and I don't know everything either. Let's ver go to chapter 2, verse 2, Proverbs 2, 2. So that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Wisdom is the what to do. Understanding is how to do it. Okay? If you're thinking they're the same thing, they're not. So that you may incline your ear to wisdom on, on what to do. Because we don't know what to do. But apply your heart to the understanding of how to walk out that wisdom. Look at verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom. Amen. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. So we've got his protection. He guards the path of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul. We don't have the time tonight to break this down, but this is a scripture we need to read over and over and let God the Holy Spirit just let that penetrate into our mind, in our heart, every good path. And did, didn't you like what wisdom does for us in verses 6 through 10? And then we understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. That's why we need wisdom and understanding. And verse 10, when wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, what that means is we're not going to be resisting wisdom and knowledge. We're not going to say, oh yeah, I got that, I already know that. It's pleasant to our soul. We're receiving it and we want more. Wisdom is the voice of God. And it does something according to this scripture. It's the beginning of knowledge. Do we need more knowledge? Yes. Do we need to know how to do our jobs better? Yes. Raise our families better? Yes. Discipline our families better? How to be a better person? How to walk more godly? We need wisdom for everything. And the Lord gives wisdom and knowledge and understanding. 
God not only stores up wisdom for us, but he shields us as we walk it out and do the right thing. He protects us as we walk it out. Glory to God for that. God will guide our path and he will preserve us. So if you want to be protected and preserved and have all the things the scripture says, listen to wisdom. Then we'll understand and wisdom will enter our heart. And knowledge will be pleasant to our soul if we'll listen and if we value it. Because the wisdom of God is speaking all the time. We're just not listening. We're just not paying attention. And we need to be receptive and pay attention. So we cannot do our destiny and walk out anything that God has for us as we're on our journey and on this path to destiny without wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. So read these passages often, especially if you're someone who's either in God's waiting room for your destiny or you're on your journey of preparation um, as, you're, as you are on those steps. God wants us to meditate and make available to us this passage of scripture as we continue our journey. So let's continue learning about the voices we're to listen to and the voices we are not to listen to. And I'm going to be very blunt. You see, I've been on this journey for a while and um, I, I've encountered many things and many of you have too. So this is a voice that you don't want to listen to. Don't listen to the voice of the haters. I'm sorry. The devil will put them in our path. We must face the fact that when it comes to our destiny, not everybody's going to be happy. Not everybody is going to understand it and will open their arms to us and say, I'm so happy for you. That was a hard lesson for me to learn. There will be some haters that won't be thrilled at all. And they will try to trash you or discourage you. You see, the more your dreams become a reality, the closer we get to our destiny, the greater the target we become for the negative opinions of others. Because the devil's trying to detour us, get us off track, get us back into our former things, and to forget about our destiny. Because the, des the devil's not very smart, but he knows this. That as a child of God, we're going to talk about God. And we're going to talk about his love, no matter what that destiny is. So some of these people may be good, have good intentions. Honey, you know you're not good enough for that. That's just not, that's not good. You have no business going after that. You know where you came from. You know what your record is. Honey, you can't do that. Or somebody who's trying to sway you in another direction. How many know you can't please the haters? You can't. You never will. However, haters, and let's call them people who don't understand our call of God, really try to make themselves an integral part of our journey. There has been for years um, some family members that we could never talk to about our destiny and what we do for Jesus. So we would set boundaries that we would not talk to them about it. First of all, they didn't understand. And, and some people are looking for negative fodder to spread to others, right? And you just have, have to have the discernment of the Holy Ghost to know who you can share with and who you cannot. But we know we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. So don't let these people, even if they're well-meaning, don't let them disqualify you or discredit you. 
Because God is the one that has called you and chosen you. So be strong enough to stand up for your call. And another helpful hint, drop to your knees often. Drop to your knees often. So let's stop for a moment and remind ourselves that the road that, the, that God has chosen for us is amazing. It's fulfilling. It's purpose. It's full of joy, and it's our heartbeat. It is our heartbeat in life. This assignment, whether you know it or not, is what you've been created and called to do. Anything else will be a counterfeit, and nothing else will satisfy. I'm telling you, nothing else will. So our destiny, unfortunately, will be littered with people who don't understand or misunderstand and sometimes might even hurt your feelings. And don't allow that to uh, make you stumble or stop or waste your time with any revenge or retaliation or unforgiveness or offense. Okay? Okay, that's big. Be sure on your journey that you examine yourself often. Because we don't want to end up like the haters do. Gossiping. Because gossip will be your enemy. Getting offended will halt your journey. Recognize who you can talk to and who you cannot. And never question your worthiness for the dream. Did you get that? Yes. Never question your worthiness for the dream. God's the one who has chosen you. And God's the one that will fulfill the purpose within you. So number three. On our journey to our destiny, beware of dream killers. You may not be able just to share with everyone your dream. And let's remind ourselves of the story of Joseph, who is a really good example. Go to Genesis 37, please. Let's remind ourselves of this story and some pitfalls that can happen. Genesis 37, verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream. And he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please, hear this dream which I've dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves, that is um, the stalks of the grain put together in, in little, um, little piles, binding the sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheep stood all around me and bowed down to my sheep. Verse 8. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for the dreams and his words. Verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream. And this time, the sun, moon, and the stars... Eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So the fact was, Joseph was a very young, 17-year-old, enthusiastic, impetuous young man. He was excited, and he thought everyone else should be excited too. But they weren't. Have you ever been there? You just expect somebody else to rejoice with you, and they don't. So this resulted, as we know, in his brothers plotting to kill him, threw him in a pit, and then sold him to some slave traders. So if I may give a personal example, while I was in a stepping stone season to my destiny, 
By the way, even our stepping stones are fulfilling when they are chosen by God. So God had me on assignment. This was, I don't know, this was, what, 10 years ago, maybe more. So on my assignment, I was teaching four Bible studies in uh, assisted living facilities, and I did this for five years. So I was coming out of the corporate environment, and God had a lot to teach me. So I was in training for those five years. If you have ever visited an assisted living facility, it is much different than the corporate world. <laughs> I had so much to learn. God had to slow me down. He had to humble me a great deal and prepare me for my destiny. But you know what? I still had a great time. I loved it. And many of those precious people received Jesus. Um, just before they went out into eternity, they met Jesus. Um, so one day, I had a brag on God that I wanted to share with someone. This person, and how dare they, they didn't want to listen. They kind of ignored me and blew me off. And they were as enthusiastic as me, and so I went to God and started to whine. Because here I am doing God's work, and they should be excited about what God was doing in the assisted living. And God spoke to me clearly at that moment, and this is what he said. I did not give them a heart for those people. I gave you that heart. In other words, don't expect them to be enthusiastic. I didn't give them that heartbeat, but I gave it to you. And you know what? In other words, be still, Judy. <laughs> that was like a light bulb going off. And I have heard those words over and over as I've moved forward, and that helps me know when to set boundaries with certain people who don't want to hear it. And you know what? It's okay. Um, of course, when they weren't excited, it, it hurt my heart, but God had given me the compassion for these folks. So the point is, you can't tell everybody about your destiny. And learn to be selective on who you speak to. So that's why we need to hang around other dreamers. Because other dreamers are going to get excited about your dream. And they'll get you, I promise. So if you don't have someone who will be your cheerleader, if you don't have someone that will get excited about the things God is doing in your destiny or uh, in preparation, you can come talk to me, because I will be your biggest cheerleader, okay? So non-dreamers are dream killers, because they don't dream. So they may think we're just a little nuts when we want to talk about our dream, because not everybody dreams high and aims high. Some people aim low, and they have a lack of expectation in their life, and they even may make you feel guilty or foolish for even having a dream. So beware of dream killers. It's hard to cultivate your dream and even dare to dream when everyone around just hangs out, has no goals, likes to talk about the old days, same old habits, same old language, satisfied with going nowhere, the status quo, and surviving, not thriving in life. Non-dreamers have a ceiling. They have set a ceiling in their life. I can't, I won't go any further. I don't dare to dream. I don't dare against, to go against the current because I'm going with the flow. 
I don't dare have different dreams because that's a little scary, scary, and not everyone's going to understand. Number four, what do I do with my dream while I'm waiting in God's waiting room for my destiny? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? That's a very good question. I just gave an example of waiting in God's waiting room for five years. And you know what? There were days that was hard. That was hard. But I learned so much. And there were so many miracles that came out of that um, that I, I won't share, but so many miracles came out of that. So while you're waiting in God's waiting room and as he's preparing you and, and just as you're waiting, discover the who while you're waiting for your do. Let me explain. Your call your assignment, your destiny will always include a certain group of people. That's why we're here. Jesus said in John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. We are a magnet for Jesus. We want to make Jesus look attractive for the people who don't know him. His love, his joy, his peace, all those things the world is hungry for, right? So there is a certain group of people that God has for you. Now let's go back to the example of the waitress. Let's say, and I've met a few waitresses that are anointed to be a waitress. Have you? They are fantastic. And they are truly ministers in that restaurant. I love that. And they make your restaurant experience amazing. Because they're anointed to do it. So their who are the patrons that come to that restaurant. If you're a nurse, your who is your patients. You, are you understanding what I mean? So discover the who before you're waiting for your do. Your call, your assignment will always be people. We, we are not called to live in a cave. Did you know that? We're not called to a deserted island, and we're not called to be isolated from mankind. No, we're not. We're called to lift up the name of Jesus and draw people to him through us. That's the goal, that's the call, that's the assignment, that's your job, and that's my job. So who's the who? Maybe some of you already know. It's the people that you have a heart for. It moves you. It moves you to tears. It moves you with enthusiasm. It moves you with love. To a plumber, a factory worker, a lawn worker, a window washer, a detailer, a carpenter. It's the clients, it's the co-workers, it's their bosses. To a child care worker, it's the precious children that they have in their care every day. To an office worker, it's the people in their office or on the phone. To the retired, to the disabled, it's the people that they come in contact with every day. What about the mom who's a stay-at-home mom, a high call, and it's the babies that they're entrusted with? To all of us, we are planted to spread the love of Jesus. Ministry can look differently. It can be a smile. It could be just a helpful hand. It can be a good attitude, a helper, doing the right thing, and doing our jobs with excellence. That sets us apart, folks. It could be sharing what God has done for you, sharing your story, sharing the good news. 
whatever God is telling you to do. Go to the book of Colossians. It's back there in the New Testament. Colossians 3.17. Are you getting this? I believe you are. I believe you are. You know, God's taking us somewhere. God's taking us somewhere in these last days and preparing us with some deep stuff, right? Colossians 3, verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And can I go back to Isaiah 43, 19? See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. God is making a way for your destiny. So what do we do from here? Well, let me challenge you. Begin to function on a higher level. Don't let the frustrations of the day derail you. There will be frustrations. There will be things that come our path. Don't major on the minor. Those things have nothing to do with your destiny. Don't let them derail you. You've got a higher call. Hold your destiny close to your heart. Even if you're not sure what it is, still hold it close to your heart as God begins to reveal it and unveil it. Pray for the who, and God will take care of the do. Did you get it? Pray for the who, and God will work out the do. Keep listening to God's voice and his direction. Don't be a conduit for every voice that comes along. Not every voice is the voice of God for us to listen to. And then let the story of Joseph teach us a good lesson. Avoid sharing everything with everybody. Don't share everything God is revealing you to do. There's a timing. There's a purpose. Hold these things precious because these are your pearls. These are your pearls. Pearls are precious. And don't give the haters an open door to tear you down. Now I want you to go back to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1. And we're going to look at verse 9 this time. 2 Timothy 1.9. We're almost done. We're wrapping it up. Don't you love how God just unpacks his message for us? Verse 9, we're going to go back just a little bit in eight, on 8. For the gospel according to the power of God, verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. <laughs> Paul told Timothy, stir up your gift. Some of you, I would say, probably most of you, know the gifts you have, know what you're good at, know where your heartbeat is. So stir up the gift. Don't let it lay there dormant. Stir it up. And then verse 7 says, don't be afraid. God's given you power, his power, love, his love. And the mind of Christ is that sound mind. We're going to need all of those things as we step out for the who in our destiny as God reveals the do. As we go to prayer, I'm going to ask you to do some things. I believe we need to surrender. And maybe what we need to do is surrender some things that maybe we need to let go of. Maybe tonight you're realizing, 
hey, this, this thing doesn't have a part of my destiny. I don't need it. This habit, this group of friends, this, this, this. Uh, I need to surrender. God, forgive me. I'm surrendering that. I don't want that. Maybe it is surrendering your gift. God, I want to use my gift for you. I surrender it to you. And then I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. Because I'm telling you your destiny is going to demand commitment. You cannot be a minister of God and not have commitment. It's going to take your time. Sometimes it takes your sleep. <laughs> because you're, you're up at night thinking, planning, praying. It's going to sometimes take everything you've got and God's going to supply everything. He's, he's equipped you. So let's close our eyes. Father, by your spirit, begin to move over my precious friends. Begin to move over those that are listening over YouTube right now. Holy Spirit, there's no time and distance in the realm of the spirit. Go now. Holy Spirit, as you move us, show us what to surrender. Maybe there's some things we need to say, Father, forgive me. I'm sorry. Surrender what you have, what you shouldn't have, and what you should have. I surrender it to you, Jesus. It belongs to you anyway. I surrender. And lastly, commit. I'm committed to you, Father. I commit my time, my attention, my finances. I commit myself fully and wholly to you and my purpose. Stir up the gift, Father. I'm not afraid. I've got power, love, and a sound mind. Lord Jesus, seal up this word by the Holy Ghost. Remind us, and I pray for these precious ones, these precious ministers of the gospel that are going out and making a difference. And we are determined to take this community for Jesus, this state for Jesus, this nation for Jesus. Use us for your honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray and seal it.